Romans chapter 8, we're going to call this one Transfigured Mind. And the reason I believe the Lord would have us go down this road ultimately is because of the last teaching setting we have was in respect to divine healing. And this will only compound your strength in that sort of teaching. We've not really approached teaching on a Wednesday. We've done it once before, but uh, we're going down this road obviously intentionally and on purpose. And um, just bear with me, but uh, I believe you'll learn a lot. I believe if you put it into practice and apply it, it's going to change your life and you're going to look a whole lot more like Jesus than before. So Romans chapter 8, we'll start at verse 5. You go ahead and pop up with me on this one. Let's stand for this and then y'all can just sit back for the next eight hours and listen. <laughs> believe me when I say we could, but we won't probably. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse number 5. It reads, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Let's pray one more time. Father, we thank you now for your word. We thank you, God, that it's a fact. We thank you, God, that regardless of whether or not people believe it or whether or not they want to twist it to fit their own theology, that it still is what it is and it's settled. And God, right now we want to take this word and read it as it is and apply it in the way that you would have us to so that we might manifest Christ in this world, in this hour. God, we love you. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God, be seated. So I'm going to read this to you again. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is is life and peace. Now the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It means it's an enemy of God. That it's not subject to the law of God and neither can it be. Now, I want you to think for a moment what it must look like to be spiritually minded and what it must look like to be carnal minded. Because I want to tell you as I have before, you've got both of those minds in your skull. We'll say it that way. You've got two minds. You have a carnal mind. You were created with a carnal mind for the purpose of doing things in this world, like tying your shoes, brushing your teeth, driving your car, and whatever else. But those things have no business in the realm of the spirit. So you're not going to do the things of God. You're not going to heal the sick. You're not going to live in victory necessarily. You're not going to overcome temptation. You're not going to say no to the devil. You're not going to do the things that Christ would have you to do without putting on the mind of Christ. Now, I do want to go ahead and dismantle a popular belief, and that is that mind renewal is a process that takes place over your entire life, and you just gradually get closer and closer and closer over time, and that's not true. And I'll show you in, in brief what the Bible says here shortly through the Greek, but ultimately what mind renewal is this. You've got two coats in your closet. One of them you wear naturally by default. That's what you live most of your life wearing. But when it comes to spiritual things, you've got to make a choice to put on this mind of Christ, that renewed mind. You've got to make a choice to wear it. It's a literal taking off one and putting on another. So it's not a process. The only thing that's a process in a sense is that we continually change garments. We go back and forth. So over our entire life, we're always in a position of needing to put on the mind of Christ. And then we wake up, we get out of bed. Most of us are already in the carnal mind again. We're ready to brush our teeth, get dressed, etc. So when it comes to spiritual things and the praise and worship and praying for people and whatever else, we've got to make a choice and understand how to put that coat back on. So, I want to read to you Romans chapter 12. We've used it a lot. I'm going to read to you verse number 2. You might write these verses down as I go because I'm going to give you enough to uh, equip you and arm you. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to understand now that the mind is your soul seat. That your spirit, we call it the heart, is where Christ has applied the blood. That's where he lives. But your mind must be renewed. It's the place that can entertain a world of iniquity. And you've got to put that mind on in order to walk in the things of Christ. So be not conformed to this world. He's speaking to Christians. Have you been transformed? Amen. Okay, well, he's speaking to Christians. Listen to what he says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Well, I thought I already had. Well, I have. I have been in my spirit, but not my mind. So we were transformed by faith in Jesus in our spirit, but our mind has not been transformed. That's why the Apostle Paul, by the Spirit, is commanding us to be transformed. So be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So evidently, in the mind of Christ, when you have the mind of Christ on and you're operating in the mind of Christ, the renewed mind, the, the same thing. 
then you have the ability to prove the will of God. You don't just talk about it. You don't just say you believe this is the will of God. When you have the mind of Christ on, you operate in the mind of Christ. You prove what the will of God is. And that's what we need in 2021 as a church full of provers rather than talkers necessarily. We need to be able to prove what we say we believe. So I want to talk to you real quick about the word transform. The word transform there means metamorphosis. It's literally what happens to a butterfly, a caterpillar. When it goes into the cocoon, it begins to metamorphosize. It begins to transform. It becomes literally an entirely different creature. Its DNA is totally changed in that cocoon. It's not the same. So the Bible is saying that we're not to be conformed to the world, but to be metamorphosized or transfigured in our mind. Now, how many of you have heard about Jesus' transfiguration on the mount? Yeah. When he was transfigured, the Bible says that, in a sense, he was lit up like a glowing light, like he was beaming, like a beam of light. The word used there is the same thing that we see here in Romans 12. It's the same context. It's a transfigured, metamorphosized experience. So seeing Jesus shine in all of his glory is literally what Paul is saying happens when you put on the mind of Christ. And when you put on that mind that the glory of Christ at that point has the ability to shine through you in a way that it never has before and you're able to function and do and speak and live and, and, and go through life as Jesus would have gone through. And that's the very point of what I'm taking you through tonight. And I want to give you a few verses before I get into the heartbeat of the message. I'm going to take you to Ephesians chapter 4. You're not going to be able to bounce around and keep up, but you may write these down and reference them. Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll start at verse 22. It says that you put off. Now, remember what I said about a garment. Put one on, take one off. That you put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not fake holiness, true holiness. Yeah. There is fake holiness in the church world today. Yeah. And then there's true holiness, and it's that of the mind of Christ that you put on like a garment. Notice the terminology that Paul uses in Ephesians 4 here. He says, put off, put off, put on, put off. Meaning that, again, like I said, you've got the carnal mind and the mind of Christ. You've got to learn how, and I'm going to attempt to show you tonight, how to put on, the mind of Christ and to put off the carnal mind. You're not on a treadmill going through things over and over. You, you're literally putting on and putting off. You understand? So I want to ask you right now, what does carnal mindedness look like? Because if I can address some carnal mindedness, then we might understand whether or not we operate in the carnal mind. And then we might conclude in a hurry whether or not it is that when we go to do spiritual things, if we're, if we're approaching those spiritual things with a carnal mind. Let me give you some examples of carnal doctrine. Carnal doctrine would say, I'm just a scumbag saved by grace. I'm the worst there is in the world. That's the kind of things the church says that is carnal mindedness because the Bible doesn't teach that. Carnal mindedness says, I'm just a worm in the dirt. I'm not good at this or that. Carnal mindedness says, if he don't wear long sleeves plaid, he's not saved. Carnal mindedness says, if that preacher don't shave his beard, he don't have the Holy Ghost. That's carnal mindedness. Carnal mindedness tells the woman that if you paint your fingernails, you're going to hell. I mean, you know what? At the end of the day, that's not Bible. That's carnal minded traditions of men. When we sing our songs and we say we just need to touch the hem of your garment, Jesus, that's carnal mindedness because Christ lives in us now and his hem is in us now. We have no need for him to pass by and we touch an external hem. He lives in us now. Therefore, we have no need for the hem of the garment. I'm telling you this because in our doctrine, in our traditions, in our songs, what we say, what we think on, what we speak on, if it's carnal minded, all it's doing is bringing us into a place of lower spiritual possibilities. We are not going to see the, the healings. We're not going to see the miracles in the same manner that we would if all we're doing is speaking death and speaking carnal minded things over our life. That's why I'm very particular about the songs we sing. I cut them apart not to be hateful or mean, but to say we've got to be very careful what we put into the atmosphere in the form of words. Because when people are looking for Jesus to pass by, they're not ever going to look in their heart and realize that there he is. He's already there. So we've got to be careful with what we say and how we say it. And I want to get into that and why here in just a minute. Because what we speak and what we think on ultimately becomes our reality in this world. Philippians 2, 5 and 6 says, let this mind be in you. Now notice it's a choice because of the first word put in the sentence, let. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Did you hear exactly what that verse said? 
Now, if we read that for what it says at face value, we're either going to have to go through some theological hurdles and understand that we've probably got some carnal doctrines and traditions, or we're going to accept it for what it says and believe it for what it says. Now, listen again. Let this mind be in you. What mind? Which was also in Christ Jesus. What did it look like? He was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, listen. It says, let this mind be in you. What mind? The mind of Christ. What did it look like? He was in the form of God. He didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. In other words, God, I'm just down here on earth. I'm a scumbag. I'm not much to it. If not for you, I wouldn't be anything. I'm just the lowest of the low. No, the Bible says, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Who Jesus knew that he was in the form of God, didn't think it was robbery to be equal with God. In other words, we need to understand that the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. Is he a scumbag, worm in the dirt? No, he is seated in heavenly places. He's the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He's the king of glory. Let this mind be in you. That was in Christ Jesus. In other words, I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm bought with the price. I'm in Christ. I'm in him. My life is hid in Christ and God. I have died and my life is now resurrected and raised with him. I'm crucified with him. I'm buried with him. I'm risen with him. I'm seated with him. Where is Christ seated? He's seated at the right hand of the Father. But the Bible says you're seated with him in him. It's not robbery to believe you're sitting on the throne of God in Christ. It's actually the answer to manifest in Christ. Are you God? No. Are you in God? Yes. So you can't bring yourself down when he is here. You've got to look at yourself with the mind of Christ in the position of where Christ is. Christ is seated in heavenly places. He's the king of glory. He's the lamb of God. He's the son of righteousness. He is at the right hand of the father and so are you. Why does it matter? It feels humble for me to debase myself and feel low and exalt him as high as I can. Yes, exalt him as high as you can. But quit debasing yourself and understand that he exalted you with him, together with him. You were raised together with him. That's what the Bible says. Look, the Bible says that he is, I'll show you a mystery. That he is as a bridegroom and you are as the bride. That Christ is your bridegroom and you are the bride. That's the mystery of the church. But let me ask you something. Is it ever in the Bible anywhere the will of God for the woman to be under the foot of the man? Is it ever the will of God for the woman to be debased and looked at as petty and poor while the man be exalted? Now the Bible says the male is the head of the household, but headship does not mean above and you below. In like manner, Christ is the head of the church. We are his body. We're not below because he's raised us like a good bridegroom. Like any good husband would, he's picked up that bride out of the dirt. We were in the dirt. He's picked her up. He's hooked her on his arm. And he's put her beside him in glory of equal power. Because that's how good he is. It's not okay for the church to be prideful and disagree with God. It is pride to disagree with God. And God says you're seated in heavenly places. You're redeemed. You're at the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. It's prideful to say, God, I'm not. I'm just worthless today. I feel terrible. I'm a scumbag. That is pride. You say it feels like pride to have the mind of Christ and think it not robbery to be equal with God. No, it's pride to disagree with God. And God says, this is who you are, and this is what I've done for you. Then you better recognize it and put on my mind, because that's what I've commanded. So that you can demonstrate me in this world. So what does a renewed mind look like? Outside of what I just told you. Doctrinally, it means, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I'm bought with the price. I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. I'm a king and a priest. I'm a royal priesthood. I'm inscribed upon his palms. I shall never be forsaken. I'm a co-heir with Christ. I have the ring, the robe, and the shoes. I'm bought with the price. That's the renewed mind. Carl mind says, I'm just an old rotten sinner. I'm just nasty. What would I do without Jesus? Obviously, what would we do? But is there such a thing as without Jesus now that you're in Jesus? Quit 
saying it then. There's no more without Jesus because he bought you. He raised you up. He received you. He made you his own. The without Jesus statements are carnal. Get them out of your mind. What does renewed mind songs sound like? You're the king of glory. What does the carnal mind song sound like? I'm just a nobody. Trying to tell everybody. No, you're not. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Get that out of your mouth. Proverbs 23, 7. Write it down because this one's great. It says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Now the word for heart here in the Hebrew literally means soul, will, or mind. It's Proverbs 23, 7. This is not exactly a sermon, so if you need to interject with a question, by all means do it. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Now, is God a liar or is God true? The word heart in the Hebrew means mind, will, or soul. It's not talking about the heart heart. It's talking about the mind, the will, or the soul. So as a man thinketh in his soul or his will or his mind, so he is. When I first started walking in the power of God and learning healing, the first verse that I took a hold of was this one, and I held on to it. Because I knew that God spoke it, and I made it mine. I prayed for folks, nothing happened. I prayed for folks and nothing happened. But I held on to it. I said, God, you said, as I think in my heart, so I am. So I'd go out and say, I'm a son of God and I can do this. I have the power to do this in Christ. I can heal the sick. I can raise the dead. I can do this because if I tell myself I can, God says it's so. Some of y'all need to get a hold of that right now for this reason. Because whatever obstacles you've run into in life and the things you think you can't do or the things you're limited by, or whatever it is you think suppresses you in this world and prevents you from being who it is that God's called you to be, it's a lie. As a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. In fact, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and take a hold of that verse because I've had this mindset without knowingly thinking about this verse. I decided a couple of weeks ago in the prayer closet when wrestling with God, that God, we shall prosper. God, we shall be multiplied. God, we shall be a church that walks in power. God, we shall grow. And as this preacher thinks in his heart, I'm telling you, kingdom life shall be. And I'm telling you, if we as a people would think in our mind in this manner too, what's going to stop us? you got to understand right now that if you don't control what comes into your conscious carnal mind, that it's eventually going to be downloaded in your subconscious spiritual mind. And whatever has influence over your subconscious or spiritual mind is ultimately going to control your life. You say, I'm bound by this addiction. Change your mind. Quit saying I'm bound. Quit saying, God, I don't know what to do. I'm helpless. Quit going to the prayer closet and begging. Go to the prayer closet and say, God, I'm tired of this mind. I'm taking it off. I'm putting on yours. I'm getting up today and I'm going to say, I'm not a smoker anymore. I'm not a smoker anymore. I'm not a smoker anymore. And as you do that, before you know, you're not going to be a smoker anymore. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. You say, it didn't happen the first time I tried it. Secular science will tell you this, and it's a fact. It takes 21 days to change somebody's mindset. You can change somebody's theology altogether by 21 days of repetition. Secular science tells you that. That the focus on a single thing for that long of a period of time will ultimately reprogram your mind. So you say you're bound by something? Give it a few weeks and stay in that one mindset. I'm free indeed. I'm free indeed. I'm free indeed by the Son of God. Free indeed. I'm free indeed. I'm free indeed. Walking up down Walmart. I'm free indeed. Amen. Yeah, as a man thinketh in his heart, so he is. That's why for nearly two years now I've been telling y'all that repetition and affirmation is vital. The Bible says in the book of Titus, chapter 3. To affirm continually the things that are aforementioned in that statement, and it's the promises of God. You go over to the Apostle Peter, one of his epistles, you'll have to find it yourself. I don't remember which one it is. 
And it says that we escape the corruption that's in the world through lust, through the promises. So if in Titus it tells us to affirm continually those promises, does anybody know what affirm looks like? What that means? New age religion affirms all the time. They say, I'm attractive. I'm loved. I am this. I am that. Most of it's flopping to the ground because it ain't the word of God. But when you take the principle of what they're doing and you take the promises of God and you begin to do it and you say, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm free indeed. I'm bought with the price. I'm the head and not the tail. As you affirm, which means speak out with authority of your life and mean it, as you affirm those things, you're going to begin to notice that they take captive the carnality in your mind and force into your mind the things of Christ. And as you do, you're going to begin to produce the things of Christ. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Is anybody lost? Is anybody getting anywhere tonight? This is the very reason that the words we speak, the doctrines we believe, the things we think on, the songs we sing, the thing, all of this stuff, man, if it doesn't come into alignment with new covenant promises, head and not to tell rather than earthy things, then all we're doing is bringing ourselves into a place in which we will not peak in the spirit. A lot of the church world is not maximizing what God has done for them. They understand that the Bible says you have this treasure in an earthen vessel. You have everything you could possibly need abiding within you. You're the habitation of God in Christ Jesus. You're above and not beneath. Well, to go on for a while. The church sees that, but they don't see it manifest in their life, and therefore they build doctrines and traditions to explain away their lack of experience. The problem is, it's not because the word is not true and therefore we need to explain it away because we're not experiencing it. The problem is, it's because we're wearing the carnal mind and trying to experience spiritual things. And we're speaking carnal things and we're singing carnal things and we're believing carnal things. We have traditions that are carnal and then we're wondering why we're not seeing the manifestation of the things that God says. But the things that God says are totally 100% dependent upon whether or not you're operating in the mind of Christ because there are no promises of God in the carnal mind. There are no promises given unto your carnal mind. There are no blessings given unto your carnal mind. It's at enmity with God. It's hostile to the things of God. It cannot receive the things of God. It is written. So if you're going to tap into the things of God, that is victory, that is health, that is, I'm going to be honest, it's even wealth, believe it or not. And I'm not going down that road because I don't believe what we see on the TVs. All of these things that are promised to the people of God are reality as we begin to receive them by faith in what God has said and put on the mind that does receive them. I've spent a lot of my life capping. You want to do me a favor, Michael? Oh, I'm too fat to tie my shoe. I'm not fat forever. I'm skinny in Christ Jesus. I'm healthy in Christ Jesus. I have a good diet in Christ Jesus. My cholesterol is good in Christ Jesus. I shall live and not die. Y'all right? Yes. Philippians 4 8. Let me read it. Finally, brethren, finally, finally, whatsoever things are true, listen very closely to this verse, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. You mean to tell me I don't need to think on who I used to be before Christ? You mean to tell me that I'm not identified by my addiction? You mean to tell me that I don't have to bring myself into bondage in order to feel justified? You mean to tell me that I don't have to tell myself I'm not pure in order to feel pure? You mean to tell me that even though I don't see everything in alignment in my life right now, that you want me to go ahead and begin to think on what's honest and just and pure and lovely and of a good report? Why, God? Because as Paul said in the book of Titus, like the Apostle Peter said in his own epistle, just the same, that as you think on these things and as you speak these things and as you meditate on these things, they're going to begin to produce the fruit of those things in your life. 
It really is like Joe Dirt says, a garden in your skull. This is a garden, dig it. It really is a garden. What you're sowing into the garden of your mind is what you're going to get out of it. If I'm sowing carnal thinking, if I'm singing carnal songs, all I'm doing is inviting the enemy of God into my life. Again, the carnal mind is an enemy of God. It's hostile to the things of God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither can it be. I'm literally, it's like inviting an atheist into my life to call spiritual shots. Please tell me how to pray. Tell me what I should believe, Mr. Atheist. That's exactly what we're doing when we invite the carnal mind a place in our life. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, If you then be risen with Christ. Who's risen with Christ in this house tonight? Anybody? Amen. This belongs to you. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where? Where do we seek? Do we seek them here on the earth? Do we seek poverty? Is there poverty in heaven? Is there handicap in heaven? Sickness and disease in heaven? Addiction in heaven? So that means those things we don't fix our mind on. We fix our mind on what? The things which are above. Where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Where do you sit? Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. In Isaiah chapter 55, a verse that people like to build doctrines upon and even do whole sermons on says this. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. And people say, well, God's ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are higher than ours. We don't understand what he's doing. We don't understand his will. That is not what it's saying. If you don't have the mind of Christ, does Christ have the mind of God? Did he think it not robbery to be equal with God? Though he had the mind of God, Christ did. He was the perfect representation of the will of God. So if we have that mind in us, the mind of Christ, then how is it even possible if we're in the mind of Christ for the thoughts and the ways of God to be above ours? If we're wearing his mind, then how can his thoughts be above ours still if it's literally his mind that we're using? Let me read the verse to you, the couple that come before that, and then maybe we'll put this together correctly. Isaiah 55, 7 and 8. Let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will receive mercy. Let the wicked and the unrighteous forsake his ways and his thoughts. This verse is talking about the wicked man and the unrighteous man. Absolutely, the carnal, wicked, unrighteous man has thoughts and ways that are lower than God. But when you put on the mind of Christ in Christ Jesus, your thoughts and your ways by necessity have to be the thoughts and the ways of God because the thoughts and the ways of Christ are the thoughts and the ways of God. Do you hear me? Some of y'all ain't receiving it because you're so rude in a tradition. And I'm giving you nothing but my law. At my previous job, I've told you before, I'm going to tell you again, I started out as a warehouse guy with lipstick on that glamorous job. They called it manager, but it's just a warehouse guy. I managed a warehouse because I was the only guy, but really I was a warehouse guy. But there came a point in time in which I began to hire people and put people into positions, and then that title became a reality. They said, you really are a manager now. I need you to manage the people. I need you to manage the inventory. I need you to manage the truck drivers. I need you to manage so what did I do on day one? I went out and I began to wrap pallets. I went out and I began to load trucks. I went out and I began to pull orders. Why? Because I found it pretty difficult to manage and be who they called me to be because I'm, I was just working alongside of these people just yesterday. How am I going to tell them what to do now? That's exactly what the church is doing. The church is getting delivered from being a warehouse guy. God makes them a manager in Christ Jesus. And then the church says, I can't be a manager. I was just alongside of them yesterday. I'm going to keep wrapping pallets. I'm going to keep loading trucks. I'm going to keep thinking like a carnal-minded person. And I'm never going to step into being a manager. 
And then I realized what was happening where people were taking advantage of me. I was doing damage to the owner of the company and I was hurting those that were beneath me because I was refusing to step into my position that was given to me by the owner. But then there came a point in time because I was in the midst of studying healing that God began to show me through things I was learning in healing and vice versa that I had an obligation to the one who employed me to step into what he had given me. Because if I didn't, somebody else would surely do it. So I stepped into it. I had an encounter with one of the truck drivers the next day. He ran his big mouth and told me no. I said, you're going to do it. Okay, man. I wasn't hateful. I just had to step in and take what was given to me. I need you to load that truck today. I need you to get that pool. I'm not staying here past 430 today. We'll get it. Next thing I know, the place is beginning to operate correctly. Things are coming into alignment. And I'm honoring the one that gave me the job. In like manner, the church has been given a manager position in the kingdom of God. You're not a warehouse guy anymore. You've got to put it on and say, I have the authority of Christ Jesus. I'm the head and not the tail. I command you to wrap that pallet. I command you to load that truck. This is who I am now, and I need you to respond to who I am. Because we cannot live as warehouse guys and function as managers. You have to put on the mindset of a manager in order to function as a manager. In like manner, you're not going to function at the kingdom of God in great power until you put on the mindset of Jesus Christ, the manager. Do you understand? 1 Corinthians 2. I'll try to hurry, but I'm surely 30 minutes out. I got, I'm going to hurry. 1 Corinthians 2, starting at verse 10. The Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Listen closely. For what man knoweth the things of a man? Save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man. Listen now, we read that and we think, we don't know the things of God. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now let's read a little further. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God. Who did it just tell us knows the things of God? The Spirit of God. Now God goes on to say you've not received the Spirit of the world, you've received the Spirit of God. Now therefore you understand the things of God if you're operating in the mind of Christ. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know, not thank or hope, but that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Why do you think I never have, well have years ago, but never anymore, and I never will again. You will never hear me pray this prayer. God, if it be your will, let it be done. God, we know you're able. If you would, stop by and heal it. Now, you'll never hear me pray that prayer. Why? Because I know the things that are freely given to me of God. I know that in Christ Jesus, I have the authority of a manager. I know that in Christ Jesus, in his mind, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know in Christ Jesus that as he did, as I do. I know that nothing shall be impossible for me in that mind. I know it. So I never beg God. I never say, if it be your will. I say, in the name of Jesus, be healed now. Does that make sense? Which things also we speak. I mean, speak them too. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. You hear what he said? He didn't just say the, the words of men. He said man's wisdom. I mean, it sounds good. They've had it in their doctrine for years, but it's not right. Which things we also speak. Not of the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but of that which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Notice. But the natural man, that's the carnal man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And that would be 100% in every respect. 
You don't get a little blessing in the natural man. You get no blessing in the natural man. In the natural man. You receive only the things of Christ in Christ. If Christ is not there, you cannot be blessed of God because you're, you're, God is angry with you every day without Christ. Because of Christ, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You now have peace with God. And now he's the reservoir of blessing in your life. There's no more curse. He's removed it. And now you are perpetually blessed in Christ Jesus. But because of Christ Jesus. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. In other words, they're in a wheelchair. I'm going to command them to walk. That's foolishness unto me. Yeah, I know it is because you're the natural man. I'm going to go here and I'm not going to beg God to do it and say, if you're able. That's foolishness. We've been teaching for years that God will do it according to his will because we know he's able that he might or he might not. No, that's foolishness, natural man. He that is spiritual judges all things. Go ahead and remember that next time you say, don't judge me. Because right now I'm spiritual. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to judge spiritually because the Bible says so. Yet he himself is to be judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Please answer us, God. Who's known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. I'm giving you enough words so that you can't walk out of here with traditions and hang on to them without having to do it by choice. We don't have to live our lives like the unrighteous man, thinking thoughts like the unrighteous man does and producing the words and the actions that the unrighteous man does. Because we have the mind of Christ, we've been given the power to live life as sons and daughters of God in this world and to think like God would think. How do you think God would think when he encountered a problem? How do you think God would think if he encountered a sickness or disease? How do you think God would pray if he ran into somebody with an addiction? How do you think God would approach it? If you have the mind of Christ, why do we approach it any other way other than that which Christ would do? Why do we ask questions and say, if it be your will? No, the Bible says you know in Christ the will of God. You say, this is too hard for me. I don't want to hear it. I'm not used to this. I'm telling you, man. Everybody in here can walk out of here. Every last one of you could raise the dead in the right mindset. Every one of you. Seven-year-old could do it. I've seen her heal more sick than most adults. Just because dad has sown into her mind enough true thoughts and true doctrine to get her to produce it. So that when she touches that person, she doesn't say, I don't think I can. She says, in Jesus' name, be healed. She don't know how it's going to happen. She don't care how it's going to happen. She doesn't need to know how it's going to happen. She needs to know that Calvary made it happen and now she prays as God said to pray. We're the co-heirs of Jesus Christ. We're called to live like kings, think like kings, and speak like kings. You'll never find a king on the street corner panhandling. Why do we come to the prayer line and panhandle and hope that God will hand out an offering? And say, God, please give us a miracle today. No, I've given you a miracle on Calvary. And now that you've received Christ, you've got the God-man living in you. And you've got his mind within you. And now you can go out into the world and be the king and the priest that I've called you to be. Amen. Colossians 3.10. I want to try to burn through this because I don't want to leave y'all here much longer. I know every one of you is ready to eat pot roast. <laughs> she made one of the Mississippi ones with the peppers. Uh, that's what you're having? Yep. You, yeah, I mean, we've got to cut it up into small portions. I really don't care. She's got to have a big portion still, though. Let's be honest. You really want that. If you want to come, the door's open. Yeah, real talk. I like peanut butter jellies anyway. It's just an excuse to eat bad. Um, in earth. No, I'm talking about peanut butter jelly. That if y'all eat my roast, I'm going to have to eat peanut butter jelly. And I'm okay with that, in a, in a sense. <laughs> Colossians 3, 10, 11, and have, and have, that's past tense, put on the new man, which is renewed. Is it being renewed, or is it renewed already? The new man is renewed, in the knowledge after the image of him that created it. Your new man, if you put him on, is already renewed, and already like Christ, and already walk in power. Galatians 4, 7 says, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Did you hear that? You're no more a servant. Quit treating yourself like one. Now you're a son. Now you're a daughter. You're family of God. That means you're an heir of Jesus Christ. What is, what is he heir of? What is Christ inherited? Heaven and earth and the fullness thereof. If you're a co-heir with him, what have you inherited? 
heaven and earth and the fullness thereof. And then when the very moment you start thinking like this, you're going to start living like this. I spent the first 80% of my salvation living like a beggar in poverty and didn't know who I was or what I had or what I could do. And just recently, I've started employing these mindsets, really, over the last couple of years. And as I do, I start seeing things come to pass. As I do, I start seeing things change. Not every time, but that's only because of the limitations I put on. I'm still growing into these things and have to learn how to maintain them on all the time. There's certain mountains that look so big that I take the coat off. I'm like, I'm not sure. But there's coming a day as I'm being taken from glory to glory that I'll leave that coat on and say, bring me the biggest mountain you can find. I walk up in a Walmart. I've told you I've been in Walmart so many times. I feel like I'm 38 feet tall sometimes, begging for a cane or a crutch. I walk in, can't find a cane or a crutch. Then I fall into sin at some point, get tempted to do something stupid, and I wind up in a bad place, and I see a million wheelchairs. It's like the devil knows exactly where my mindset is. But when I'm walking like the king and the priest that God's called me to, which I should be doing all the time and not just sometimes, I walk up in the stores feeling like I'm 10 feet tall. I'm like, I challenge any devil to show its face right now. Seriously. I'll go to people and be like, I'm, I'm not sure, but you look sick. Let me pray for you. <laughs> Let me ask y'all a question. Think about it because it's not a trick question. It's just a hard question. What gives your body its commands? Your hand. It doesn't do what it does unless something tells it to. What tells it to? Your mind. What gave Jesus' body its commands when he walked the earth? His mind. So if you're now his body... Listen closely. If you're now the body of Christ and you also have his mind within you, then what should the world experience when they encounter you? Assuming that you've actually put on the mind of Christ, which is in you, since you are the body of Christ, then they should see Jesus. So why do we pray with an old covenant carnal mind and say, God, use us. When what God is really looking for out of the church is somebody that will be willing to put on his mind and demonstrate his nature. Are you hearing me? We stand back and say God uses us as if God will choose selectively whoever he wants to use in a moment's time. And the truth is, under the new covenant, we're now the body of Christ. We now have the mind of Christ. God has given us the resources, and now God's saying, go out and use what I gave you. Stop asking me to use you and go out and use what I gave you. There's a difference. This ain't the old covenant anymore. God's not on the outside. He's on the inside. He doesn't come and go. He come and stays. There's a difference. Under the old covenant, he would come upon a man. He would leave and he was done. New covenant, the apostle John says, you have an anointing that abides within you. That's the anointing of Christ. He's there. He stays there. You're his body. You have his mind. Do his works. The father commandeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Think about the manner of love that God has bestowed upon us. The Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then after that, look at what he's given us. I told y'all not long ago, I'm going to try and hurry. You want to play some music? It might make it more palatable. We might have to pray just for a second. I'm, I'm getting close. I'm trying to burn through this so fast because I, I don't want to leave none of you hanging because there's a couple things I want to touch on. Does anybody have a phone that I can borrow? And a piece of blank paper. It's been a while. You can just have a seat here on the altar if you'd like. And give me a piece of blank paper and fire up your flashlight. A smaller, I can just use like a half a piece. So I don't need a whole piece. Yeah, that's good. Cut in half, will you? Can somebody cut the lights? Oh, yeah. Now we're getting somewhere. Here's your mind. Be ye transformed in the spirit of your mind. It's not transformed when you get saved, but your spirit is. What the Bible says is that Christ, who is the light of the world, moves into your spirit. Boom. This is going on in you right now. Way brighter, though. you got the treasures of heaven. What happens when your mind is renewed? Check it. When you start thinking on things above and not on things beneath you start speaking things of heavenly things and not earthy things. Alignment begins to happen. 
I want you to notice the light is already impacting that soul. What's happening in the spirit is already impacting the soul. That means I can get some results. If I get 60% healing, it's probably because there's not perfect alignment, but there's something good <laughs> happening. My mind's being renewed here. Here I come. As you renew your mind, look what happens when that soul aligns with the treasure within you. Woo! Yes! Woo! And when that happens, you go out and you raise the dead. You heal the sick. You cast out devils. You walk in victory. You don't live in despair. You don't live in defeat. You live in the victory of Jesus Christ because your mind is renewed in Christ Jesus. The Bible says to fix your mind on things above and not on things beneath. The word fix there is not talking about repair. It means to place it in its appropriate position. I want to take you through one more thing. There's a lot more I'd like to take you through, but I feel like y'all are done and you're, and you're ready to... I want to take you to Matthew 6. Now, I would if you got a Bible, go there. I want to take you through this and then we'll probably quit after this. Now, I'll read to you verses 19 through 23. And some of you have heard this before, but this is ridiculous. It's deep. Everything I'm fixing to say to you is verifiable. All you got to do is click on your Strong's Concordance and look in the Greek, see what it says. I challenge you to look up the uh, definitions of what I'm fixing to tell you. Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to start at verse 19. I'm going to take you through verse 23. Now, when we read this, most of us don't read it in the way that God would have us to read it. But as I do read this, I want you to remember the last couple of messages and spiritualize what Jesus is saying. Because when Jesus speaks, he speaks of spiritual things, not of earthy things. In fact, the Bible says to regard no man according to the flesh. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. If you're born of the spirit, regard the spirit. And Christ is speaking to you right now of spiritual things, not carnal things. So Matthew 6, starting at 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. He's not talking about houses. He's not talking about bugs, I promise. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. I just demonstrated this really. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Let me break this down for you in the original language and let it blow your mind. Lay not up means to do. Do not put stock in. That's what that means. For yourselves treasure means deposit of wealth upon earth. Now I'm going to put it together in a minute. Just bear with me. Upon earth means natural realm or carnal realm. Where moth and rust. Now look it up. Means the eating of spiritual food or meat where moth or rust literally for some reason don't have a clue why King James picked rust and moths but in context of the scripture it means the eating of spiritual food or meat doth corrupt means perishable and where thieves break through and steal but lay up for yourselves treasures that's deposits of wealth Holy Spirit is the earnest of your inheritance he's in you in heaven, that's the spirit realm. That's the Christ-minded realm. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and their thieves don't break through and steal. I'll explain in a minute. Don't get nervous. For where your treasure is, which is either your Holy Ghost-filled mind of Christ, or it's your carnal natural mind. That's where your treasure is. It's in one of the two places. Their will means to sojourn toward, or to follow after, or to be drawn toward. Your heart, that's your subconscious mind, or your renewed mind. Be also. The light, that's the illuminating lamp of the body is the eye. The word there is ophthalmos. It means soul seat or mind. If therefore thine eye be single, meaning unified or in alignment. Remember the illustration. 
Thy whole body shall be full of light, meaning transfigured or transformed. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, carnal, like a sinner. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Now I'm going to go ahead and read this to you. I'm going to piece together every one of those original languages and put them together in a paragraph. And I want you to hear what Jesus was really saying. Because I'm going to be honest, I read the King James and almost only the King James. I'm not here to get weird about it and tell you you can't read another one, but that's the one I'm familiar with. And I'm, it's hard for me to break away from it and anything makes sense if I read another version. So... Um, so the truth is though when I read the King James a lot of times they word it in a way that makes literally no sense <laughs> and uh, you get to reading in the original language you're like where did you even get that so let me read it to you it says do not put any stock in the carnal mind or the carnal realm but rather put full stock in the realm of the mind of Christ the place where your spiritual food is incorruptible and the mind is renewed because your spiritual mind will gravitate toward wherever your treasure is. The illuminating lamp is the soul. If therefore your soul and spirit be single or unified or aligned like I just showed you. Your entire being will be transfigured or metamorphosized or renewed. Did you hear what Jesus was saying? Forget about the carnal mind. Put your treasure in the things of Christ because when you bring alignment with the treasure that's in you and your mind that's up here, when you bring them into alignment, that light that's in you is going to shine forth out of your soul and you're going to be a beacon of power and light and hope in this world. And as that alignment happens, you're going to begin to move in power, being transfigured and metamorphosized and look like Christ. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, metamorphosized, or transfigured by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. How many of you want to live exactly like Jesus and do the works that Jesus did because he said you'd do greater? How many of you want to see your co-workers get healed tomorrow? How many of you want to see folks get saved tomorrow? How many of you want to see people actually have their chains and their bondages broken? Because when you come to them, there's such a light and such a power radiating from you. The unction within you breaks chains and bondages. How many of you want to speak and people get chill bumps, which we know to be the Spirit of God? That's going to happen as you put on the mind of Christ and have your mind renewed. Because right now, as believers, the treasure is within your spirit. As alignment, divine alignment happens, your eye becomes single rather than double. Your eye becomes single. The mind's eye is what that's talking about, to be honest. When it becomes single and in alignment with Christ in you, you're going to radiate Christ all over this world everywhere you go. So you say to this preacher, you've got a gift I don't have. I told you before. No, I don't. What I've got is alignment. And it's the same thing you can have. I've commanded my mind to come into the obedience of Christ. And I've put on that mind of Christ. And when I wear that mind of Christ, His light shines through me just like it could for you if you'd put on that same mind. Do we understand? Do we have any questions? God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the treasure of your spirit. God, we thank you that you are turning this people into powerhouses. And I know, God, in 2021, you're going to bring in increase to Kingdom Life Church, and we're thankful. But, God, I know as you do, we're going to be training up warriors. We're going to be preparing the saints. We're going to be equipping the church to go out and do what Jesus did. And I believe, God, the Kingdom Life Church is going to quickly gain a name for that church down there on the corner that's able to get it done. And I thank you, God, that that's not going to be limited to the preacher. But I intend to fully pass the baton as much as possible to the church that's able to do the same things that I would do or you would do. And I believe, God, they're going to do greater. And I thank you, God, that your favor is upon us and we're going to see it come to pass. God, I know that there's no negative talk coming from this one. We know for sure that the kingdom is within us. It's come nigh unto us. And as we speak and we preach and we pray, so it does unto those around us. And I believe in God that you shall be glorified in these temples, in this house, in the coming days. And you shall be seen and heard in and through us, God. And we thank you for it. 
God, we love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. What do you say we spend a couple minutes with the Lord before we go home? That'd be cool. What's up? I do have one question. One question. Why were we ever taught? I don't know. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm going to tell you my honest assessment is that, like I mentioned before, that people build doctrines typically based upon their lack of experience. They see that it's there. And, and there's two things. This is one of the biggest problems. There's two covenants. you got the Old and the New Covenant. And I preach from the Old Testament all the time. But I apply it through New Covenant mindsets. When you don't divide the two, you bring yourself into confusion. And you have a double mind, which is unstable in all of its ways. And people have doctrines that don't fit the new covenant because they've dragged them from a covenant that doesn't belong to them. But outside of that, usually it's because they've laid hands on somebody, nothing happened, and then they decided to build safety nets so they don't get embarrassed and self didn't have to be put to shame. And they say, well, must have not been God's will, or we don't know what his will is, or all that nonsense we make up because we didn't get the results we were looking for. You're going to find that there comes a moment of complete breakthrough, like where things just overnight totally shifted for you. When I first started pursuing this, when God showed me that my thinking was wrong, my mind was wrong, my doctrine was wrong, when God showed me that initially, I uh, immediately agreed, but I didn't totally understand. Yeah. And uh, so I started, in respect to praying for people, I started getting 30% or so immediately. Obviously, that's not 100%, but it's something. I'm starting to see change. Well, uh, I've still got some things that need to be ironed out and fixed. I prayed for probably a thousand people and saw nothing. And it was ultimately because of the beggarly mindsets and the wrong doctrines. And then God spoke to me and said, you've been chasing your tail, man. I've given it to you already. It's there. What I want you to do is go out and believe that you have it, command it instead of begging for it, and watch what happens. And what I did, I started getting some measure of results. But I had to be renewed. I had to think on things above and not on things beneath. I had to practice affirming the promises of God. I had to get to know the Word, specifically the, uh, the, the promises of God. If you're new in this and you're not totally settled in this stuff, I, don't, I, I hate to put it this way, but I really wouldn't spend a lot of time in anything prior to New Covenant. And truth is, the new covenant didn't begin until Jesus breathed up the last, until he gave up the ghost. The gospels aren't even new covenant. He's teaching the law. I would encourage you to get stuck in Ephesians, Colossians, Galatians, Philippians. Get stuck in those over and over and over again. And then start speaking what you read and start proclaiming what you read, saying, God, this is me. The word for mirror, you look in a glass darkly, like I said before. The word for glass there is isoptron in the Greek, and it means mirror. The glass is the epistles, which I just mentioned. In other words, what do you see when you look in the mirror? You see yourself right now. Those epistles, that isoptron tells you that right now, you're a king and a priest. You're a royal priesthood. You're as Christ is in this world. You're the head not to do it. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. you got to look into that isoptron agree with God. You don't have to understand how. You don't have to recognize the migraines or the wrinkles and say, God, it can't be. You say, God, you said it is, and so it is. Because I see something different in the body, I understand that you see what's in the spirit, and so it is. And there come a point in time in which it shifts, and you say, I am a king and a priest. I am a royal priesthood. When somebody comes to me and says, we just sin every day, we'll sin until we die. I say, no, we don't. That's not in the Bible. I've been made free indeed. That which is born of God sinneth not, nor can he. I said, I'm in Christ Jesus, and I walk in the power and the grace and the goodness of God. Yes. Shut it down if it doesn't come into alignment with that stuff. It probably ain't going to happen for you overnight, but as soon as you make that choice, that shift is going to happen. You're going to start seeing the results. What did Jesus do when he came into the earth? He came into the earth for the very purpose, outside of dying for sins, to unplug and undo the doctrines and traditions of men. They would say, Moses said this, and he said, but I say it to you, this. They would say, but I heard this. This is what our fathers taught us. But I say unto you this. 
Jesus came to dismantle the carnal mindedness and the traditions of men to say this is how it really is. Because he understood that upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. But they will prevail as long as she's thinking like one that ain't built upon a church. Rock. That makes sense. You just keep pursuing it until you start seeing the change. Hey, the truth is, in order to agree with God in this in respect to these things, you have to feel delusional to some degree at first. Because none of it feels true. None of it seems true. None of it really looks true. But God says it's true. And in order to not call him a liar, we have to agree with it even though we don't feel like it. And as we do, we'll start seeing that manifest in our life. Anybody else? What do you say we pray for a couple minutes?